customized geometry. And all it needs from you is your goals and your constraints as input. This approach allows the computers to go off and explore the entire solution set, the whole solution space, and come back to us with ideas that we, by ourselves, might never have imagined. And what I'm most excited about right now is that generatively designed things are making their way out into the real world. And today, I'm thrilled to share with you some generative design work that we've been doing in partnership with Airbus for the past five years. Future of flight in 2050. Now this concept plane is a long way off, but we've been busy developing the technology and techniques to make it real one part at a time. Now the first component that we've been working on is this partition panel. It divides the cabin and supports the jump seats that the flight attendants, attendants sit in during takeoff and landing. Now the current design of that partition, which has been flying in the A320 successfully for decades, it's already strong and lightweight. Made from a modern honeycomb composite, there is nothing wrong with it. But clearly, Airbus isn't interested in what's merely good enough. They want to explore the limits of what is possible. So they gave our algorithm the performance goals and constraints for this partition, and it returned tens of thousands of options, all of which fully met those goals. And then through a collaborative back and forth between the human design team and the computer, the optimal design is chosen. And here it is. This is the first time this project has been shown to the public. <laughs> Maybe afterwards. This is Airbus's bionic partition. It weighs half as much as the original, and yet, strangely, it's even stronger. Each partition installed into an A320 will save 25 kilos in weight. Imagine the impact of redesigning the entire cabin this way for every Airbus 320. Airbus estimates that this will save half a million metric tons of CO2 per year. That's like removing 96,000 passenger cars from the road. Now the other cool thing about this project is the synergy between generative design, additive manufacturing, and advanced materials. One of the great benefits of additive manufacturing is that complexity comes for free. And generative design is the perfect tool to take advantage of that flexibility. It can make designs that are even more optimized. And beyond that, we can also take a look at new materials. In fact, Airbus developed a brand new powder alloy called Scalmalloy that specifically takes advantage of generative designs. This new partition, which Airbus is making entirely out of Scalmalloy, it's now being tested for flight readiness. It's passed all of its preliminary tests, and one of the last steps in certification, a 16G crash test, is scheduled for next month. And this all sounds like it's part of the future, but it's not. The plane that you fly to AU next year might very well have this bionic partition in it. So our computers can now generate. They can come up with their own solutions to our well-posed problems. But they're still hardly intuitive. They still have to start from scratch every time. And that's because they never learn, unlike Maggie. Maggie is smarter than our design tools. What do I mean by that? If Maggie's owner picks up her leash, she knows with a high degree of certainty it's time to go for a walk. And how did she learn that? Simple. Every time the leash got picked up, they went for a walk. She just had to do three things. Pay attention, remember what happened next, 
and create and retain a pattern in her mind. Now here's the crazy thing. Just in the last year, advanced machine learning systems are starting to do those same things. They're learning to learn. Never before having seen these photographs, the system can describe and label them with no human intervention. How? The same way you did when you saw those images. You, it remembered just as you would everything it had seen before and used those patterns to describe new scenes. This ability to learn is now making computers better partners for design, giving them some of the intuition that we humans have. Here's an example. Would you cross this bridge? Most of you are thinking, no way. And you arrived at that decision in just a split second. You did not need to go stop and do a deep analysis, build a BIM model of the bridge and set loads and run analysis. You just kind of knew intuitively that that bridge was unsafe. Our deep learning systems will have the same kinds of instincts about your designs. You will literally be able to show something to the computer, something that you've designed, and it will look at it and be able to tell you, that'll never work, or, hey, that looks good. And when that happens, we'll finally have a true partner in design. Those first three levels of computing, passive, generative, intuitive, they're all just computer science, right? There, there's no people required. But now we're bringing the human into the algorithm as well. And I mean that very literally. This is called empathic computing. It's the incorporation of human responses into the system so that it can make better decisions that are better aligned with your decisions. As the system listens to you and learns about you, it comes to understand your likes and your dislikes. It starts remembering your tastes and your aesthetic preferences. So it can give you not just what you asked for, but what you really want and maybe what you really need. Now, how many times have we talked about learning a design tool? What I'm talking about now is a design tool that learns you. So this is how I see technology augmenting us cognitively. Computers aren't just going to be working for us, they're going to be thinking with us. Now let's take a look at another category of technology that augments us physically, robotic systems. Now there's a fear that robots are going to take jobs from humans. I believe that more interestingly, humans and robots will evolve their capabilities by working together. I don't think, especially for you in this room, that you're going to lose your job to a robot. But you might lose your job to someone who is using robots in clever ways to augment their capabilities. We have an applied research lab in San Francisco where one of our big areas of focus is robotics and specifically human-robot collaboration. And this is one of our robots over here, Bishop. We wanted to build a robot to help a person working in construction do repetitive, high-precision tasks without the need for robotic or computer expertise. Tasks like cutting out holes for outlets and light switches in drywall. And we put a trim router on the end of Bishop's arm and gave him natural language interface and artificial sight. That way, Bishop's human partner can tell him what to do in plain English and with simple gestures the same way that you might talk to your dog. And you'll note that there's no CAD and there's no CAM, not even a computer to interact with there, just you and the computer, you and the robot. Now Bishop is actually the busiest robot in our lab and he's been working on another project for you here at AU. And the goal of this project, which we call the Hive, is to prototype the experience of humans, computers, and robots all collaborating on a complex design problem. Hive is a pavilion that will be built here at AU under the direction of an artificial intelligence program giving guidance to both the robots and the humans. And the interesting thing about this pavilion 
is that it could not have been designed or built by either humans or computers working alone. I invite you to take part in this experiment and tell us what you think. Hive will be just outside the exhibit hall all week. Now, I've been talking about how robotic systems can augment our capabilities through human-robot collaboration. Well, now I'd like to introduce someone uniquely equipped to show us the ultimate potential of this partnership. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Dr. Hugh Hare. Thank you, Jeff. Hello, uh, Autodesk community. How are you doing today? I can't hear you. Woo! So I do not build buildings, 